On the fateful day of November 21, 2021, police entered a house after a daughter's frantic 911 call concerned for her mother's well-being. It was eerily silent, and there were little pools of blood on the hallway floor. Slowly, she ventured into the living room where her worst fears were horrifically realized. There, on the floor, lay the lifeless remains of her 65-year-old mother, June Fox Roberts, bearing the scars of a savage and merciless attack. What's most unsettling about this is that it could happen to anyone, and there's not much you can do about it. The sheer brutality of the crime, along with the perpetrator's demeanor, is what makes this case truly chilling. June Fox Roberts, a 65-year-old mother and grandmother, was cherished for her kind and generous spirit by her three children and grandchildren. Living in the small village of Clan Twit Fander near Ponty Pride in South Wales, she was a beloved figure within her community. As the director of a family-owned IT firm and the owner of June's Cakes and Shakes Cafe, she was well-respected in the local business community. Her career was a colorful one, ranging from managing a chicken farm to assisting in children's schools, running a coffee shop, working in IT, and owning property. June's life was filled with friendships from all corners of the world, thanks to her travels for work. Looking forward to retirement, she had plans to build a dream bungalow with a beautiful garden and allotment, a personal haven for her later years. Despite being divorced and having outlived her ex-husband by over a decade, June's life was one of connection and achievement. She was eagerly planning for a future surrounded by friends and family. The police arrived at the crime scene at 2.45 p.m. and immediately commenced a thorough investigation. The scene they encountered was one of the most gruesome on record. June Fox Roberts had been the victim of a brutal attack. Her body was found decapitated and dismembered, with her limbs placed in bags throughout the house. The attacker had been unusually careless. There were footprints in pools of blood, which were believed to be the perpetrators. Additionally, a pair of shorts were found in a large bag in the front room, which also contained one of June's arms. The investigation unfolded in a chilling sequence of events. June was at home by herself when an intruder entered through her unlocked front door. Alerted by the noises downstairs, June went to investigate and encountered the intruder in her hallway. The assailant launched a swift and brutal attack, delivering blows to her head. June's defensive wounds on her arms indicated her attempts to defend herself, but a severe blow caused her to fall and lose consciousness. The perpetrator then savagely stomped on her head and upper chest. After the attack, June was dragged to her dining room where she was placed on tar. The assailant retrieved one of June's own axes from the garden and began to gruesomely dismember and decapitate her body, placing her limbs into separate bags scattered around the house. Notably, the intruder had also brought in a chainsaw, which, for reasons unknown, was not used. One of the more startling revelations came as the police surveyed the house, including the bathroom. They discovered signs of freshly applied hair dye and also signs that someone had shaved in the sink. It appeared that after the gruesome act, the killer went upstairs to the bathroom then attempted to alter their appearance to evade capture. In one of the bedrooms, the perpetrator had taken clothes belonging to June's daughter, Trish. Officers described the case as extraordinarily rare and possibly the most heinous they had ever encountered. At this point, the perpetrator remains unidentified, raising urgent questions about their identity and whereabouts. Given the gravity of the crimes committed, it is evident that the individual is highly dangerous and currently at large in South Wales, presenting a critical concern for public safety. Even more terrifying is that police were sure that the assailant was a stranger who had just walked in off the street with no real motive. Seemingly, everyone was in danger. Police were trying to find a suspect, but there was only the report of a missing man in the area called Luke Dye. Dye had experienced a psychotic crisis leading to his admission to a psychiatric hospital in March 2019 for an acute psychotic episode. He was there for just under a month, and upon release, he was prescribed antipsychotic medication. In July 2021, concerns about Dai's erratic behavior, specifically his insomnia and incessant pacing, prompted his parents to reach out to the community mental health team. A home visit was conducted by a consultant psychiatrist and a social worker, during which Dai disclosed that he had stopped taking his medication. The psychiatrist responded by providing him with an emergency supply of antipsychotic medication. In September 2021, Dai began attending university in Cardiff and moved into a shared student residence. 
His housemates found his behavior difficult to live with, citing instances of him keeping other residents' room keys, playing music at high volumes, and damaging the fire alarm system. The situation escalated on November 11, 2021, when Dai threw water over a female resident and then used offensive language towards her. This incident led other students to file a complaint with the letting agents, and consequently, Dai was evicted, leaving behind all his personal items. He never went home. He just disappeared and was now deemed a missing person. Although Dai was a potential suspect because he was someone who was potentially high risk, there were still no solid leads in the case. Suddenly, the police received an unexpected tip from a scrapyard employee. The yard was right behind June's house, and the worker reported seeing a disheveled man behaving oddly in the tire yard. According to the employee, the man was seen talking and singing to himself while wrapped in a blanket and showing other signs of unusual behavior. The scrapyard CCTV footage suggested he might have been using the containers to sleep rough in. Believing they might have a lead on their suspect, the police responded swiftly and went to the tire yard. However, by the time they arrived, the man had vanished, seemingly having abandoned the yard permanently. The search intensified as the police began looking for a man they now dubbed the container man. By that time, the shorts discovered in the bag at the crime scene had undergone DNA testing, and a complete DNA profile was established. Although the DNA did not match any of June's family members, and since the family did not recognize the shorts, the police believed that they could belong to the assailant. Unfortunately, the DNA profile did not match with any records on the police database, leaving the identity of the suspect still unknown. The investigation continued as authorities searched for the person connected to the DNA. Police looked closer into Luke Dye. On November 18, he was seen near the university campus in Trey Forest and was seen trying various doors at the student union. The shorts he wore bore a striking resemblance to those found at the crime scene, instantly propelling him to the main person of interest in the investigation. When police investigated his room at the university halls of residence, they found images of women in bondage on his walls, disturbing artwork, and chilling posts on his social media. One post read, I'll break your neck. I'll rip out your spine. I'll take your, underscore underscore. And enjoy her with some fine wine. And another read, I honestly don't think people should underestimate how much of a, underscore underscore, psycho I am nowadays. Police then observed him on CCTV in a car park asking someone where the nearest toilet was. His bags, both the ones in his hands and his rucksack, appeared very similar to those that the container man was seen with. Despite the well-kept appearance of Luke, as opposed to the unkempt look of the container man, a closer look revealed that both individuals had a limp. With this observation and the matching bags, the police began to suspect that Luke Dye and the container man were one and the same, making him their prime suspect. Almost as soon as this revelation happened, there was another major breakthrough in the case. Container Man's image had been shared with other local forces, and in a village close by, a man had been spotted in a back street eating sweets and matching his description. He was apprehended and taken into custody where he initially provided a false name and was incooperative. He requested the presence of a Welsh translator during the interrogation, complicating the process for the officers. Luke was also initially adamant in his refusal to submit a DNA test, and it took two days to persuade him to comply. Once the test was conducted, the results confirmed a match with the DNA found on the shorts at the crime scene. With a translator in place and the DNA evidence aligning, the interrogation commenced. The case unfolds. Luke Dye was confronted with the heinous crime he was accused of. During the interrogation, the detective said, she was a grandmother. She was murdered in her home over the weekend. She's been subjected to a pretty horrific attack. Her head's been cut off, as have both her arms and legs, and her body parts have been put in bags in the living room. Someone has tried to clear up the house. You fail to account for any of your movements over the weekend. How do you explain that? However, Luke chose to remain silent, responding to the detective's questions with a stern, no comment. The detective further pressed, Did you shave your beard? dye your hair, change your clothes in an attempt to get away? Once again, Luke responded with, no comment. On April 28, 2023, Luke Dye appeared at Newport Crown Court and pleaded guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. 
His defense lawyer, David Ellis Kask, said, No words can properly describe what Luke Dye did to June Fox Roberts. All the anguish he caused to her family and friends. Justice Griffith imposed a hospital order, meaning Dye can be detained in a hospital indefinitely. He added, You only did this terrible thing because of your mental illness. You have no previous convictions, and there's no evidence you had any rational motive for what you did. You thought you were receiving messages from what you described as a higher power and were acting out commands. Reflecting on the tragedy, June's family stated, We are satisfied that this sentence is the best possible outcome for everyone. Once you met June, she was never forgotten. She was a force of nature, our family friend, rock, and safe place. And we will feel this loss for the rest of our lives. The tragedy of this case resonates deeply with both families involved. June's family has suffered an unimaginable loss, with their mother taken from them in such a violent manner. On the other hand, Luke's family must grapple with the man that they once knew, who once dedicated himself to charitable acts like raising money for the homeless, and then trying to comprehend the heinous acts that he would go on to commit. Murder is a chilling crime that can strike anyone, anywhere. It serves as a reminder that we must remain vigilant and take steps to ensure our safety. The case of June Fox Roberts highlights the devastating consequences of such a brutal act and the impact it has on both the victim's family and the community at large.